In the last video, we talked about the equivalence principle and the idea that if I have a lab out in deep space, then it is equivalent, it is the same as if I have that same lab freely falling in a gravitational field. Or another way to look at it is if I have a lab that's out in deep space but is accelerating, I add some engine on here and accelerate it, that's going to be exactly the same, indistinguishable from a lab that's just sitting on the surface of the Earth. And we looked at the different versions of the, of the uh, equivalence principle. But there's one thing that is important that I left out, uh, a restriction on what kind of labs that we can have. And the restriction is that these labs all have to be what are called local or small. Now, why is that? Well, if I'm on the surface of the Earth, then we remember that the form of, the, of uh, Newton's version of gravity is that the gravitational force is equal to this g, the same gravitational constant that I have over here, times the two masses that are interacting over the distance between those two masses, this, uh, this radius r. Now, if I'm standing on the surface of the Earth, then my feet are going to be closer to the Earth, closer to the center of the Earth than my head is. So that means that my feet are going to feel a greater gravitational pull than my head is going to be. These are referred to as tidal forces. and they would tend to stretch me out. My feet are closer to the center of the earth than my head is, so it feels a greater pull than my head does, and that makes me stretch. Now, that effect isn't seen when I have this accelerating, when I have this accelerating frame. So this is two ways that they're different. Uh, the same thing will happen to me if I'm freely falling. At the, at the bottom of here, uh, there's gonna be a greater acceleration uh, hard to read that a little bit, but sorry, greater acceleration down here than there's going to be at the top of my lab. But the smaller my lab is, the less of an effect that will be. So when we use this equivalence principle, the requirement is that we're dealing with a small laboratory uh, compared to the how fast the gravitational field changes. So I just wanted to mention that, but let's see what some of the outcomes are when we apply this equivalence principle. So I'm going to redraw this picture uh, with a person out in space, uh, freely flying out in space. So there's my capsule, there's the other stick figure of me, out in space and when we have the ground and the lab is freely falling. So we said that all experiments that I do in this lab out in the middle of nowhere have to be the same as the results in this lab. So let's say I have a laser. So I'm putting a little laser here and it's going to fire a beam of light straight across the chamber. And it's gonna be picked up by a receiver over here. Now I'm out in the middle of nowhere, no gravity is acting on me everyone's going to agree that this light is following, you can think of it as its natural path, or it's going to follow a straight line. Okay, so I fire this laser across my, uh, my floating observatory, and the light travels in a straight line. Well, the same thing is going to happen in here. It's going to be fired from the laser, and it's going to reach the receiver in my frame. But what does a person who's standing over here see? Who's standing on the surface of the Earth see? Well, initially, the box is going to be maybe not moving very fast, but as the beam crosses, this laboratory is going to fall, and it's going to fall at an increasing rate. 
So as the light beam is traveling across, it's going to start to curve downwards. And since the box is accelerating, it's falling at a, at a greater and greater rate, then this trajectory is going to appear curved. So the box started up here, but by the time the signal gets to the receiver, maybe the box is, maybe my lab is, is down here. And the final position of my receiver is here. So the same thing happened. The beam was fired from the laser and made it to the receiver. Here the beam was uh, fired from the laser and made it to the receiver, but the lab was falling in this guy's frame of reference. So that beam of light is going to appear curved. The weird thing that we, that we think about now is that in this frame, this light was following a straight line. It was following what we can think of as its natural trajectory. But that means in this frame, it's still following a straight line. So, so is it actually following a straight line or, or how do we understand this? Well, the way that Einstein interprets this is that this is going to follow a straight line, in sp not in space, but in space-time. And that space-time is going to be curved. So since we're on the surface of the Earth, since we have this gravitational field, it, that gravitational field curves space-time. And this line is following a straight line. It follows a, a straight line in a curved space. So space-time is, is curved by gravity. So this offers a very different picture as to how gravity works. In the Newtonian frame, gravity is a pulling force. Uh, I'm applying a force to something when, when it's in a gravitational field. It's pulling on me. But this picture says that, no, in this, in this frame of reference, nothing's pulling on this straight line. It's out in the middle of, nothing's pulling on this beam of light. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Nothing's pulling on me. I just feel myself floating there. This is saying that still nothing is pulling on me. I don't feel any, any weird forces to myself. This is still my natural motion. I'm still following a straight line but this is now going to be a straight line in a curved geometry, in a curved space. And this really got Einstein thinking that geometry, that gravity, uh, instead, of being, uh, instead of being some pulling force that acts instantaneously over distances with no visible thing that's actually allowing it to pull. There's there's nothing connecting the sun to the earth that we can see. It's the the outcome of this is that we interpret gravity as being geometry. And later on we'll see how massive objects uh, massive objects change the geometry of space-time around them, and then we start to see these weird effects where light will curve around massive objects. For instance, we have this effect that's known as, uh, as gravitational lensing, and that's where we have, uh, uh, we have the sun. So here's the sun, and if we're on the Earth over here, if a star, if we have a star in this part of the sky, then we see the light come directly towards us. But if we have a star where the beam of light will pass closer to the sun, then this beam of light, and this is highly exaggerated, this beam of light will actually curve around the sun. And this is an effect known as gravitational lensing and was one of the, was one of the first 
huge verifications, uh, huge confirmations of a prediction of general relativity, and was actually what put uh, was what made Einstein originally famous, uh, and gave him worldwide renown in uh, pretty much overnight. But when we're looking at these curved, so-called curved light trajectories, these are still following straight lines, but massive objects curve the space around them, so these are straight lines in a curved space. And we'll see more of the details of this in the coming videos.